Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning sermon. Uh, we are looking in 1 Corinthians. We've been going through that book. So this morning, we're, our scripture reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17 to 24. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17 to 24. It says, Nevertheless, as the Lord God has assigned to each one, as God has called each person, so must he live. I give you this sort of direction, or I give this sort of direction in all the churches. Was anyone called after he had been circumcised? He should not try to undo his circumcision. Was anyone called who is uncircumcised? He should not get circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Instead, keeping God's commandments is what counts. Let each one remain in that situation in life in which he was called. Were you called as a slave? Do not worry about it. But if indeed you were able to be free, make the most of every make the most of the opportunity. For the one who is called in the Lord as a slave is the Lord's freedman. In the same way, the one who is called as a free person is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. In whatever situation someone was called, brothers and sisters, let him remain in it with God. This morning we're going to talk about keeping the commandments of God. Uh, back several years ago, uh, cycling is my hobby. Mountain biking in particular is something that I do quite often. And Several years ago, I'm not sure exactly how many years, but you know, in the range of six to seven years ago, I wanted to go a little bit faster. I wanted to try to be a faster mountain bike rider. And I had a 24-hour mountain bike race. So that's where I ride for 24 hours straight and try to do as much distance as possible in that period of time. So I got the help of a coach. I said, okay, I want to see if I can get faster. I want to get better at what I'm doing. And he was an experienced triathlete who competes as an amateur. He still does uh, on the world stage. He goes to Hawaii and does the Kona Ironman competes against all these world-class athletes. Uh, he's a local guy, lived in, our, in St. Albert, in our city. And he gave me that instruction. He was the one who showed me kind of the best way to train, the best way to get in better shape. And for having a coach, it's great to have a coach, great so, for somebody to give you that knowledge. But if things are going to work, I had to actually do what he said. You know, he's not uh, the type that he sits and calls me in the morning first thing and says, hey, Dean, you got to get up and do your workout. He just told me, you got to do this this week. And he said every day what I was supposed to do. And it was up to me to follow those things, to do it, to actually follow his instructions. Uh, he would specify exactly when I was supposed to do a hard workout, when I was supposed to rest, you know, all of those things to try to become a faster mountain bike rider. That was the whole goal of the whole thing. One thing that's interesting about training and uh, uh, athletes and people who are trying to get a little bit faster, uh, I have no problem resting. But a lot of the time, I've heard with a lot of athletes, a lot of people that are really dedicated to their sport, motivation is not the problem for them to actually go out and ride hard and do as hard, go as hard as they can, but slowing down is. So you actually have to listen to your instruction and listen to your coach saying, hey, you got to take a day of rest. You got to rest and relax for a while because that's how training works. You know, you stress your physical body. You kind of break it down a little bit when you do your hard workout, and then you got to take that day or two to rest and build yourself back up again. And it's that cycle of stressing and re recovery that makes you a faster, stronger athlete overall. So the coach is the one with the experience. I didn't know how to do any of that stuff back at that time. He was the one with the experience. He knew what to do. And it was my job to follow his instruction. If I actually wanted to accomplish what I was hoping to accomplish, I had to actually listen to what he says and, and do it, you know, make sure I carried through with it. And in Christianity, God is the one who knows the best. And it's our job as Christians to do what he says, to follow his commandments. Uh, it's up to us to do that. Uh, God gives everybody free will. He gives us that choice whether we do it or we don't do it. And it's up to us to follow that. But he's the one who has all the knowledge. He knows how we're built because he created us. He created the world so he knows how we interact with the world. And he knows best. Just like my coach knew best, God knows best with respect to everything. And it's up to us to follow his commands. This idea of command keeping, though, might not be a very popular one to certain people. In a religious sense, with respect to Christianity, uh, some people equate it with what is called legalism. And the idea of legalism is that you need to follow all of these sets of rules, and then by doing that, you earn or you merit salvation. You merit your way into heaven. You earn your way into heaven. And that's how we are saved. So that's essentially what legalism is, is following that set of rules. Once you do that checklist, okay, I'm in. I'm good. And that earns your way into heaven. And that's not really the way the, the New Testament teaches it, but that's what some people think. That's what some people believe. Uh, other people might understand how the New Testament 
uh, lays out the plan of salvation and the idea of following his commandments, which we're going to look at, but they still don't like it. They think it's an unpleasant task. You know, I should be able to do what I want to do. You know, I don't have to follow somebody else's rules or follow somebody else's instructions. Um, maybe that's a carryover from childhood when your parents are telling you to take out the trash. You just don't want to take out the trash. You know, you don't like being told what to do. And so you re uh, resist against it. You push back. You know, maybe when you're constantly commanded to do things at work or whatever situation you are, you kind of resent it in a little way. So when you read in the Bible and it's telling you to do your, uh, to live your life in a certain way, to follow these commands, don't do this, do this instead, you have a bit of a pushback. You have a bit of resistance to that. I should be able to do what I want to do. So this idea of command keeping can be a little bit of a, a challenge uh, to some people. And it's understandably so. You know, I don't think it's, uh, we should look down on anybody that has a, a problem with this or it's a challenging thing. We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in our scripture reading, and we look at just verse 19. It's an interesting verse, and one thing that I find fascinating that we're going to look at is there's two other verses we're going to look at that have very similar wording to this, and it gives us insight on the idea of keeping God's commandments. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 19 says, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Instead, keeping God's commandments is what counts. We are to keep God's commandments. Uh, that's something that's not debatable. It's something that we need to do as Christians. But what is the proper attitude toward command keeping? Uh, I, want to, I want to look at some things that we should consider with respect to keeping the commandments of God. Uh, hopefully we can change any of those negative feelings that you may have with respect to keeping commandments, to following good, what, what God wants you to do. You know, listening to his instruction, listening to what he is telling us. We are to do it. We are to follow those commands. So what is the proper attitude that we should have toward command keeping, to following his instruction? I mentioned legalism earlier, and that is one thing that it should not be, uh, we shouldn't have that kind of attitude toward command keeping, is this idea of legalism. Again, legalism is that idea that somebody earns or merits their salvation by their obedience. It's a checklist, and they've earned their way into heaven that way. You go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. This attitude is something that's incorrect with respect to Christianity. And we can see this in this passage. So Titus 3, we're going to look at verses 3 to 7. So Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 3. It says, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, on whom he poured, uh, whom he poured out on us generously through, our, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. We are saved by his grace and mercy, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of what he has given us. We are not earning or meriting our salvation by our obedience, by following those commands. It's kind of a, a thing that's that's difficult to grasp, I think, in a lot of situations. Uh, I, I still continually have, you know, I have to think about it when I'm trying to either explain it or think about it just in my own mind. Uh, when we follow his commands, we do have to follow his commands. That's required. But when we do that, we're not earning or meriting our salvation. And it's very clearly stated in this passage. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. There's nothing we can do as people to earn our salvation, to earn our way into heaven. Uh, we've made too many mistakes already, and everybody's done that. And when we make one single mistake, then we haven't earned our salvation. So it's impossible for us to do that. So this idea of legalism, that's something that we should not be considering when we are following God's commandments. Uh, one thing that happens, though, when they read this passage, or some people, when they read this passage, unfortunately, many react to this, and they go to the extreme other side of things. They all of a sudden say, okay, so if following his commands doesn't earn or merit my way into salvation, I have to do nothing. You know, following commands is not important whatsoever. But that's not true either. If we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 19, this is the passage that we read earlier, it says, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Instead, keeping God's commandments is what counts. We still have to follow his commandments, but the reason why we are following those commandments is not to earn our merit our salvation. We follow his commandments for other reasons. So where's the balance? You know, we have uh, 
Following his commandments so that we earn our merit our way into salvation. We have understanding that his grace saves us and his mercy, so we don't have to follow anything. So somewhere in the middle there is where we should be. You know, where's this balance? If you go to Galatians chapter 5, this is our first passage that very closely, the wording in this passage very closely matches uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 19, and it helps uh, shed some light on why we should follow his commandments and our attitude to following God's commandments. So Galatians 5 and verse 6. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6 says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, Instead, keeping God's commandments is what counts. In Galatians 5 and verse 6, it says, The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. I thought I would explain a little bit about why he's talking about circumcision here. Uh, it always feels a little uncomfortable talking about this, but uh, the idea of circumcision and uncircumcision, he's referring back to the Old Testament law. That's what he's talking about in this, uh, when he's referring to circumcision. Uh, circumcision was part of the Old Testament law. That was a physical act that was required to be a part of the covenant. And that is what he's touching on here, is this, these physical acts have no value. And he's talking about that Old Testament law. Circumcision has no value because we are saved through grace and not through this physical rite, this physical rite of passage, this thing that they had to do in the Old Testament. So that's what he's addressing in this. He's saying that these physical things you did under the Old Testament no longer apply because now we have a new covenant. Our heart is circumcised, figuratively. And so then he's saying, because of that, the only thing that counts is following God's commandments in 1 Corinthians 7, and in Galatians 5 and verse 6, the only thing that counts is faith is expressing itself through love. So keeping the commandments of God can be an expression of faith working through love. Faith at work through our love for God. If you go to James chapter 2, this is one of the best passages, I feel, that explains uh, how faith and deeds work together. Uh, this idea of faith, belief in God, and the actions that you carry out in your life. So essentially following the commandments of God, following what he has taught us in the New Testament scripture. So James 2, verses 14 to 18 is what we're going to read. So James chapter 2, starting in verse 14, says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you faith by my deeds. So here we have those two extremes. You have this idea of having faith and doing nothing. So that's the person that says, okay, we're saved by God's grace, so then I don't have to follow any commands because he's going to cover everything. And then you have the other side of things where it says, okay, I have only deeds and no faith, so I'm earning or marrying my way into salvation because of the things that I do. And here we have this balance. You have faith, and you express that faith through the things that you do, through following through that action. We have the belief in the saving power of God's grace. And that faith is expressed through our actions as we put his commands into action in our life. We express that faith through the things that we do, through the way that we follow his commands. And our life is changed through that faith that we have, that belief in him that he is changing our lives. He is going to save us. And we express gratitude and we express our faith through our actions. We get to John 14. We talked about uh, faith working through love. Love is also a part of this, a big part of this. So John 14 and verse 15. Very short little verse, but again, very clear, very concise in its meaning. John chapter 14 and verse 15. This is Jesus talking, and he says, If you love me, keep my commands. Again, commandments, following his commandments, is something that is required as Christians. And Jesus loves us, and we love him. You know, we are dedicating our lives to him. We're following him. He's our savior. And when we love someone, we want to please them. We want to uh, make sure we make them happy. We want to do things for them because we love them and we appreciate them. And keeping his commandments is us expressing our love for Jesus. We express our faith, or our faith is expressed through love by keeping the commands of God, by doing what he tells us to do in the scriptures. So thought of as faith working through love, hopefully keeping the commandments of God 
is something that we can understand and we can do in a in a in a way that we understand why we're doing it. We're doing it because we are expressing our faith through love. We're expressing our faith because we have that love for Jesus. And it is something that's very important to do. Another side of things. Okay, we're going to go to Galatians chapter 6. Uh, this is another one of those verses that very closely matches 1 Corinthians 7 verse 19. It says, Circum well, 1 Corinthians 7 19, it says, Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Instead, keeping God's commandments is what counts. So if you go to Galatians 6 and verse 15, and I think this is just fascinating that these verses match up so well together. Galatians 6, verse 15 says, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. So we have keeping God's commandments is what counts. Faith expressing through or faith expressed through love is what counts. And in Galatians 6:15, we have what counts is the new creation. So keeping the commandments of God can be thought of as helping to produce a new creation, produce that changed life when you become a Christian. You go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Becoming a new creation is a blessing that we enjoy by being in Christ, by becoming a Christian, by being a child of God. When we do this, we become a new creation. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to read verse 17. So 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. When we become Christians, we become new people. Uh, we've left behind certain things and we've adopted a new life as Christians, a life that is a changed life, uh, something that is, uh, we are a different creation, essentially. When we're raised out of those waters of baptism, we put on Christ. We are in Christ in that sense and we have become a new creation. Uh, if you go to Galatians 3, we'll look at verses 26 and 27. If we want to enjoy this blessing of being a new creation, it involves keeping the commandments of God, following what God wants us to do. Uh, for example, we are to be baptized to receive Christ. Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27. It says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So again, this phrase, in Christ, we are in Christ, or we have clothed ourselves with Christ. When we do this, we become a new creation. And at baptism, we are clothing ourselves with Christ. We're putting him on like we would put on a coat. You know, we're putting him on. We're, being, we're putting on those qualities of Christ. We're becoming a new creation. And following his commands is a part of that process, a part of becoming that new creation. Colossians 3. You go to Colossians 3. This expands on this idea. Uh, this whole passage does. I'm only going to read verses 12 and 13. But if you read the, past, the verses before and after this, you really get a good idea of what's being expressed in this passage. The idea, though, is taking off your old qualities and putting on qualities to become like Christ. Colossians 3, starting in verse 12, says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I was watching a lesson, I think last year sometimes, where I, I, uh, there, the person giving the lesson had an illustration. He brought a couple of coats in. Uh, I couldn't find any for my lesson, so I didn't grab any coats myself. But what he did was he had a, a, a blazer, you know, a suit jacket, essentially. He said uh, he put on this coat and then he tried to put on another coat on top and it didn't fit. You know, there was too much, too much fabric inside there. And first he had to take off the old one and put on the new one. And that's what's happening when you become a Christian. You have some qualities, some habits, some things that you did before you were a Christian. And you have to take those things off. You have to remove those things. And then you put on Christ. You clothe yourselves with Christ. You put on these new qualities that uh, exemplify being a Christian. Uh, it's the same thing with those habits, those practices that don't fit in the Christian lifestyle. Lifestyle. We take those off and we put on new qualities to become more like Christ. So if we think of keeping the commandments of God as necessary to become a new creation in Christ, keeping the commandments becomes very important. It's something that we need to do. We need to follow these commandments. Again, not to earn or merit our salvation, because that comes through grace, 
but we are to follow these commandments to become a new creation, to clothe ourselves with Christ. That's part of the process of becoming a Christian and part of the, the Christian walk as you live your whole life. You're continually trying to add these qualities to your life. Uh, it's a process that never never ends, essentially. You always have part, or always have something you can improve upon as you live your life. So this attitude, if we have a proper attitude toward keeping God's commands, we can hopefully better do it. We can make sure that we do keep his commands and we can do it with a really good attitude. Uh, it's a demonstration of our faith and love. And it's part of the process by which we become a new creation in Christ. But is keeping commands hard? Is it laborious? Is it something that's unpleasant? Um, again, if you're talking to your kids, tell them to do chores, you know, it's something that's unpleasant. They don't want to do it. Should that be the same way that we approach following the commands of God? Is it something that we don't want to do? Uh, if you go to 1 John chapter 5, you know, if you ask that question, you say, is command keeping a difficult task? Is it difficult to keep the commands of God? Uh, I think that's a tricky question, and I think it depends on which way you look at it. Uh, if I was to answer that question, I'd say yes and no. You know, you have two sides of this in a, in a way. Uh, and we can see one side of it when we look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. The Apostle John is writing this here, and he has an interesting thing that he says about this. So 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. He says, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. So, with respect to what Apostle John has to say, he's saying that commands keeping the commands are not burdensome. Yeah, it's not that bad. Uh, again, I, I, it'd be interesting to see what people think about this. You know, in my mind, I think, well, no, it is hard sometimes. Like, it's hard to meet the standard. It's hard to react in a certain way. You know, when somebody attacks you for whatever reason, you have to react in a Christian-like manner. You have to be patient. You have to, uh, you know, respond in a proper way uh, to those attacks. And it, and it can be difficult. Loving your enemies is a very hard thing to do. But John here is saying his commands are not burdensome. So what does he mean by that? Um, keeping his commands, keeping God's commands, is something that does help us in life. Again, back to me being coached. Uh, it was hard to do the workouts. You know, it's something that you had to push yourself. You had to work really hard. But it was easy in the sense that I did not have to debate whether it was the right thing to do. I got the coach because I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't really know the best way to train. I didn't know... You know, when I should work hard, when I should rest, you know, how hard should I work? I didn't know any of these things. So I asked him because he knew the answer to that. And I didn't have to debate. And in that respect, it wasn't burdensome. It was it was a relief to know that I could trust him and I could follow his instructions. And it wasn't burdensome anymore. All I had to do was do the work. The work part of it was, burden, well, difficult. It was challenging. But it was challenging in the sense that it was hard work, but it was something that I felt good about doing. You know, I really felt good about carrying through that, that difficult workout because I knew it was the right thing to do. If you follow the instruction laid out in Scripture, your life is going to be better. It might be hard to carry out certain uh, commands at certain times, you know, to stop certain things, to make sure that you act in a certain way in other, so in other situations, but you always know it's the right thing to do. Life becomes more simple. You have answers to the dilemmas that you might struggle without God's insight. If you don't study the scriptures and follow the things that he tells you to do, you might have that doubt in your mind. I really don't know if this is the right way to act or the right thing to do in this situation. And in that respect, his commands are not burdensome. It makes your life better. It makes your life much more simple to follow his commands and understand that you are doing the right thing. Again, those times when you are carrying it out might be tough and you might have to really work hard to do it. But you know that you're doing it for the right reasons, and it can be unburdensome in that respect. You go to Psalm 119. This gives you, or this gives us some good insight on this concept. So Psalm 119, I'm going to read verses 129 to 131. So Psalm 119, 129 to 131. It says, Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. I think it's funny that phrase, I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. That's, that's describing somebody who really wants uh, to, to hear what God has to say about this. It's recognized that God's instruction is valuable. It's beneficial when followed. His statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. We, we should understand that. We should understand that the things in the New Testament and the Old Testament that are taught to us are wonderful. It's going to give understanding to us. It's going to unfold the word. It's going to give us light when we unfold those words and we understand what he's saying. 
In that respect, his commands are not burdensome. We can understand what we are supposed to do. All we have to do is carry it out. And that's where it could be a bit of a challenge. But sometimes the hardest part is just deciding to do it, to actually take that step to follow his commands. Uh, laboring over whether or not to make a decision is often harder than actually committing and carrying it out. Um, again, you think about having kids. If you have kids, you'll probably understand this. You tell them to do something. You say, hey, you got to take out the garbage. You got to do this or that. The hardest part for the child, much of the time, is making the decision to do it willingly. Uh, oftentimes, the, the discussion of whether or not they should do it or trying to convince them to do it quickly takes longer for them actually to do it. Once it's decided, the chore itself really isn't that hard. And sometimes keeping the commandments of God can be the same way. If you are, you know, kind of wavering, you're not really sure if you want to do it or not, deciding to do it is often the biggest struggle. Once you commit and once you go for it and you say, okay, I'm going to act the way God wants me to act. I'm going to follow his commands. Actually carrying those things out maybe not, might not be that bad in that situation. It's that uh, deciding to do it might be the toughest part of the whole process. So how important is keeping the commandments of God? Uh, we've learned that keeping his commands does not earn or merit our salvation. But hopefully we can see that the proper attitude is required when thinking about keeping the commandments of God. It is important. It is something that we must do. When we keep his commands, though, it's a demonstration of our faith and love. It's required as part of the process by which we be become a new creation in Christ. As we take off those old qualities and put on the new qualities, we clothe ourselves in Christ with love being that thing that binds everything together. That process takes following his commands, and that's why we do it. Following his commands can be hard to carry out sometimes. But they're also not a burden in the sense that it removes all doubt as to whether or not it's the right thing to do. And we will have a better life when we do follow his commands. We'll benefit as we share uh, as heirs, uh, having that hope of eternal life. We'll have a good life here, and we'll have a good life after this passes away. And all that is, or all that comes through us following his commands, doing what he wants us to do in the New Testament. So I'd like to ask the people watching this morning, are you keeping the commands of God? Are you doing it for the right reasons? Are you doing it with the way that God has described to us in the New Testament scriptures? I'd like to offer an invitation. If you have not yet clothed yourselves in Christ, if you haven't taken that step to dedicate yourself to him and be in Christ and be a child of God, we can show you how to do that in the scriptures. Uh, please reach out in one way or another, either through a private message or a comment or an email or a phone call. And we can show you in the scriptures how to do that, how to accept this gift that God has offered to all mankind. And if you are a Christian who's struggling in any way, Again, please make your needs known in some way, form, some way, in some situation, or in some format, and let us know, and we can show you how to, uh, or we can help you, I guess, get through that situation through study of the scriptures and through the support system that we do have. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us your scriptures, uh, for um, allowing the Holy Spirit to work in that way to provide us the message uh, to provide us those things that we can do to accept this gift of salvation that you've offered to all mankind. I pray that you can give us the strength that we can make that decision to follow your commands. And I pray that you can help us as we do carry out your commands, that we do uh, our best to clothe ourselves with the qualities that you've described in Scripture. And you can be with us through that process, that we can be that example to the people around us that really shows what Christianity is all about, that we can act with kindness, compassion, uh, and show our patience in, a lot of, in all situations, and really uh, show what it is to follow the commands that you've laid out to us in the New Testament Scriptures. And I thank you so much for giving us your Son and giving us your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, be safe, be well, and God bless.